Hi folks, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a minute. We'll let the last minute attendees log in and get settled. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the California Coastal Resilience Network webinar series. My name is Ella McDougall, and I am the facilitator for the CRN, as well as a Climate Ready Fellow for the State Coastal Conservancy. The California Coastal Resilience Network promotes knowledge exchange through monthly webinars on climate-induced impacts on human communities and coastal habitats. We will provide a link to the network if you'd like to join or watch past webinars. We also post recordings of the webinars, including today's, on our site, whose links can be found in registration and the follow-up emails. Today's webinar is called Wading into Flood Risk, Research Efforts in Imperial Beach and San Diego Bay. We are hosting folks from the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation, a part of UC San Diego's script Institution of Oceanography. These two Southern California case studies demonstrate nearshore monitoring and enhanced flood assessments and how they help communities effectively design adaptation responses to both storm events and sea level rise. We have three panelists from CCCIA or the Center. The first is Laura Engeman, who is the Program Director and a California Sea Grant Extension Specialist with a focus on coastal resilience. Laura manages several coastal climate adaptation initiatives and research partnerships. Second, we'll have Dr. Julia Fiesler, a postdoctoral scholar at the center. She researches observational nearshore physical oceanography, infragravity waves, surf zone modeling, and wave run-up, with a focus on the city of Imperial Beach. Our third presenter, Dr. Angelica Rodriguez, is also a postdoctoral scholar at the center. Angelica studies the conditions and physical processes that result in extreme water levels along the San Diego Bay shoreline as a part of the Resilient Futures San Diego Bay project. We will listen and watch their presentation for about 40 minutes and then follow up with a Q&A session. During their talk, if you would like to submit questions, please do so using the chat box or the Q&A box. I will collect and review and then read the questions, and Laura, Angelica, and Julia will respond. This webinar is being recorded and will eventually be available for review. So with that, let's get the presentation uh, undergoing, and Laura will pass it off to you. Great. Hi, everybody. It looks like we have a few more that have joined us. So thanks for everybody uh, for taking some time to join another webinar or video meeting of the day. Um, we appreciate uh, that your uh, time on the computer is precious these days and glad you could join us. Um, so again, I'm Laura Ingeman. I do represent the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation based at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. I'm also an extension specialist with California Sea Grants, as Ella mentioned. Um, and one uh, what the center is about and uh, what these projects are about. Hang on. Laura, we're having some audio issues hearing you. Are you there? Oh, was I not mute? Was I on? Oh, I was talking, but I would guess I was still muted. Did you guys hear anything? No problem, but no, we haven't heard for a couple okay. seconds. 
<laughs> okay, I thought I unmuted it and I was trying to push my presentation to the next slide and I still can't get that to work either. Hang on one second. Um, um, so as I try and work that out, um, I said, uh, so I, again, as Ella mentioned, I'm Laura Engeman with the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation based at Scripps at UC San Diego, and I'm also Extension Specialist with California Sea Grant, um, and wanted to uh, share with you today um, a little bit about our projects and research that are happening in, co in several cities in, around San Diego um, in an effort to look at flood risk and in today's world, but also flood risk and sea level rise um, hazards going forward. So, sorry, I cannot seem to figure out why I can't change my slide. Um, Do you want me to take control back and then reassign you as presenter? Uh, yeah, maybe give that a whirl. That would be great. Yeah. All right. All right, Back. we can see that. Okay, perfect. Back in action. It was frozen for some reason. Thanks, Ella. Um, so uh, what we're about at the center is uh, looking at coastal research in a couple different areas and, and coastal and climate research in a couple different areas. And specifically, one of those areas is advancing sea level rise and coastal hazard research. Um, within advancing that science we're also looking at ways that we can use that science to support and inform coastal adaptation strategies uh, many of those strategies are pilot and demonstration strategies so looking at ways that we can provide baseline science uh, monitoring information and evaluation uh, strategies to understand how those strategies might mitigate risk um, now and into the future and then the overall goal of our programs is really to look at building resilience uh, along the coast and also building expertise uh, within coastal communities, within coastal leadership, and also within next generation scientists and climate practitioners. Um, so the focus today is really on um, how can monitoring networks both help communities respond to hazards now, specifically we'll be talking about flooding and water levels, and um, how can we also use that type of monitoring information to help, help us uh, figure out what type of signals coastal communities should be uh, focused on measuring and monitoring to know what their tipping points or what their trigger points are uh, for adaptation response. So many of you on here may be coastal practitioners um, and you may be thinking about adaptation strategies and adaptation pathways. So my last slide is uh, taken from a paper in environmental science by Scott Stevens and others uh, with their graphics showing exactly uh, the, this type of adaptation pathways where you see down on the bottom, you see what the current status is and then you've got the little triangle noting um, various signals that you would monitor and then following that uh, various uh, triggers and adaptation thresholds which would be the point at, at which you would decide to take a different adaptation plan. And the way that you think about this in terms of flooding um, is maybe flood frequency and inundation depths, but it may also be uh, monitoring, particularly for us on the West Coast, monitoring various different extreme tides, uh, various wave energies from coastal storms, as well as uh, background um, water levels and sea levels. Um, as they continue to rise in a more long-term trend fashion. Um, so both uh, Angelica and Julia are gonna talk a little bit about uh, these conditions in the framing of what causes flooding and why it floods, and then how we can use that information to sort of inform um, what, kind of, what type of response is the most appropriate or might be the most effective um, in your coastal community. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia.
Hi, folks. All right, let's see if I can get this screen up and to presenter view. All right, can everybody see that okay? I think, I hope. All right. Let's get Okay, so um, my name is Julia Fiedler, and as Laura said, um, I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about the improve, improved flood forecasting that we have going on at Imperial Beach. So <clears throat> in the background of this slide, you'll see the waves coming up the beach here um, in at Seacoast Drive at Imperial Beach and overtopping the riprap. That's these little rocks down here. And um, Imperial Beach, this this was a uh, an event that we captured um, with our instruments that we had out there with our observing system. Um, this was January of last year, and we had a LIDAR down here to observe the waves as they uh, overtopped. And Imperial Beach, um, this particular stretch of it is fronted by the ocean here and then backed by the estuary behind it. So when it floods here, these uh, condos are particularly vulnerable. So let's see. Um, the city of IB, it's a low-lying coastal community. Uh, the flooding is largely caused here by energetic wave events and seasonal peak tides. Uh, here's a couple of pictures that I extracted from our website. If you go to that, you can see historical photos of flooding around Imperial Beach. And <clears throat> these are sorts of things that um, the city wanted to help uh, plan for. And um, hopefully prevent if you can put some sand out there or find some sort of adaptation. So as I noted before, let me see if I can get my mouse on this screen. Um, IB is down here. It's uh, pretty much on the border with Mexico here. And here's San Diego Bay above it. That's what Angelica is going to talk to you about. And again, this particular stretch that I'm concerned about um, is it's got the estuary on one side and the beach on the other side. And uh, here's a plot of flooding days uh, predicted for the 21st century. And this is for San Diego. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that no matter what the sea level rise scenario is uh, that you're looking at, the flooding days are predicted to increase. So here in San Diego, the intermediate scenario is showing that almost every day by the end of the century um, is gonna be a flooding day. And so these sorts of forecasts of when flooding is going to happen are helpful for us getting an idea of what things are gonna be like in the future. So coastal flooding is a combination of a number of different processes. You have sea level rise, you have your water, le water level anomalies, those could come from things like El Nino. Um, then you have your tide, and on top of that, you have the wave effects. And the wave effects are the part of the equation that I choose to focus on. And the wave component, um, this is higher frequency than the other components. So these are things that are gonna be happening at a time scale of like 30 seconds to five minutes where you have those uh, frequent inundation events. And here in California, especially, our, our flood events are largely from tides and distant storm events instead of something like the hurricanes or storm surge that you would see on the East Coast or in the Gulf states. So this is why we're choosing to focus on the waves. And so when I say the wave portion of this, um, it's a combination of wave setup and the run-up excursion. And I'm gonna be talking to you about wave run-up. So that's sort of the extent of how far the waves can reach up the beach. And this setup is sort of an elevated still water level at the shoreline that's just coming from these waves interacting with each other as they rush up the beach. And so the, the question that I'm trying to ask is how high will the waves travel up the beach? And so to answer that, um, what we have is a lot of observations that we use at Imperial Beach and uh, beyond. So we're, we're using a combination of a bunch of different uh, novel techniques. We have LIDAR that can be captured from a drone or a truck. In this case, from the event in January last year, we had LIDAR on that condo. And then we have pressure sensors and current meters out here for validation, including pressure sensors up here on the beach. And then we're using a wave model that's coming from the CW Wave Buoy Network. 
um, in order to get our forecasts of the waves. And so what you'll see on our uh, website is this, this forecast here. And this is um, something similar you'll see on a lot of uh, government agency websites, but uh, I'll go ahead and explain this. Um, so here we have time on the x-axis and then water level elevation on the y-axis. And then we have our red line flood threshold that's determined um, locally at each specific site that we're looking at. And the uh, tide component of this is in the darker blues, and then the wave component is in the lighter blues. And um, note that the, the wave component can be quite sizable, almost a meter sometimes, or at least in this plot, sometimes it can be larger. And uh, note that there's also no error bars, and we, we are working on it. That's sort of what this is all about. And um, it might not look like it from this plot, but there's a considerable amount of error in the light blue wave component. And that can make a considerable difference for wave flooding. And that's part of the equation that um, I'm, trying to, um, I'm trying to reduce the error that we have by using a more accurate um, prediction of wave runoff. So how do I get things to be more accurate? How do I reduce that error? So <clears throat> there's a number of things that go into this, but basically I model the waves. And the wave model is fed by historical waves and historical bathymetry. Um, so that's measurements of the beach below and above the water. And those are fed into a model where I run it a number of times so that I can generate observations of wave runup. And then from there, I can get an empirical prediction of what the waves are going to do. So the simulated runup is something that um, I use the SWASH model for. And uh, the SWASH model is a phase resolving model. It's field tested and it's shown to be accurate in both the surf zone and for the bulk wave runup statistics. And <clears throat> uh, looking at this plot here, the orange is the swash model and then the blue dots are the observations that we had from that lidar again this is from that event last year and this model is fed with a current meter that we had offshore and so we do know that it is quite accurate they they line up really well um, in terms of observation versus model and to get the these sort of accurate run-up simulations you do need correct offshore wave conditions, a good beach profile above and below the water. And then you do need some sort of validation with the observations in order to make sure that this stuff is making sense. That's how you can refine your model. <clears throat> so that was our model. And then the things that we use to feed into that model are the waves and the bathymetry. So we're lucky enough in this um, location to have 20 years of wave data from that CDIP um, buoy wave model network. And we also have 10 years of bathymetric observations. So these observations were collected with GPS equipped jet skis, ATVs, and then push dollies where we actually um, roll something into the surf zone. And um, nowadays we're, we're using LIDAR to get more accurate observations. And in Southern California, at least, we, ha we have this type of data uh, approximately 100 meters, every 100 meters uh, all along the beach. And so let's see, this little star here was that event that I showed you on the first slide. And <clears throat> um, this is just to say that what, what we did observe was um, pretty extreme, but these are the type of data that I'm, I'm plugging into this. Um, predictor. And so I'm trying to use just the eroded profiles and then the large waves. And that's to get sort of an idea of where you would expect to get the most extreme wave runoff. So into the model, we're putting these large waves, um, large energetic waves that are coming in from distant storms. And then we have our eroded bathymetry. And that's going into our model where we run it a number of times at uh, mean high high water so just to simulate where we would expect to have these flooding events and I can generate a number of observations there and get my empirical prediction so the standard empirical prediction that we use for a wave runup um, involves this number here is r2% that's the extreme wave runup 
involves the foreshore beach slope, the wave height, and the wavelength, and this is all offshore. And so the foreshore beach slope is just going to be that area where the waves are rushing up and down the beach. And then these are determined from um, either predictions or observations offshore. And so here's a plot of um, spectral energy offshore. And I want to point out that these are, are two very different wave condition days. But using these and picking out the peak, um, peak frequency events, you are, you're going to get run up that's predicted to be almost exactly the same. But these are two very different kinds of um, wave conditions. If, yeah, right. So two very different kinds of wave conditions. Uh, so the goal of what we're trying to do with this new predictor is to accommodate a broad and multi-peak spectra with a frequency weighted integral. So that's essentially just saying that we're trying to incorporate all the information that we have offshore that is coming from our wave model instead of just trying to get the peak wave height and wavelength. And because you are incorporating more information, you can capture things like this secondary 10 second swell that's coming in. Um, and that'll be important for figuring out how high the waves are actually gonna make it up the beach. And so uh, what I do by this, I, um, from our run up uh, data, I'm able to, or run up, run up model data, I'm able to figure out um, how to vary these parameters in order to make this R2% sort of uh, match our data so that I'm tuning it to the beach and to the historical large waves. So again, running through that, it, again, I know I went through it kind of fast, but we have our historical waves and our historical bathymetry. I simulate all the large waves, and then out of there, I get my run-up statistics, and then I come up with this emulator, um, which is this empirical power law approach, and or integrated power law approach. And uh, of course, we had to name it the IPA because uh, that's just what we do. And <clears throat> so one of the questions is, how well does this work? So if you are comparing the standard bulk parameter approach, here we're using the Stockton equation, but tuning it to our specific beach, and you compare it to all the observations that we have in the, um, in the modeled run-up, you can see that there's quite a bit of scatter about the mean. And in particular, this, this star here, again, that was that January event, um, it doesn't line up quite well using these bulk parameters. If you want to take the integrated approach, but keep this sort of um, style of this type of forcing, then you can significantly reduce the amount of error that you have. And then furthermore, if you want to use the best fit parameters, that's varying those M and N exponents in the integrated form, then you can uh, really reduce your error and tighten down what the predicted runoff is supposed to be. So the moral of this story is to take the integrated approach. Um, I think basically no matter what form you have, uh, this is going to tell you a lot more about how high these waves are gonna run up your beach and reduce your error bar. So if we're looking at a hindcast and observations of uh, using this formula at <clears throat> Imperial Beach, now again, we're looking at uh, time here on the X axis and water level on the y-axis. And then we have this flood threshold here. This is all relative to mean sea level. Um, the times above this mi minor th flood threshold are, uh, in theory, supposed to flood. But you do see that we do have some false positives. And these are confirmed with either an RBR pressure sensor, or we had an observer down there taking pictures of the flood events. And so what we're trying to do currently is refine this model and understand a little bit more about what we need to incorporate um, in order to get this to be more accurate so that the city can make plans going forward. So for more information on what we're doing with this forecast, I encourage you to visit this website. And <clears throat> um, on this website, you will find 
We have the flood forecast here at all these locations in Imperial Beach. And then we also have things like past events where you can see pictures of the flooding and also um, observation, observations such as uh, the beach as measured by the LIDAR. And so we're trying to explore sort of the errors and uncertainties of, that are coming from this. Like what observations do we need in order to get our IPA predictions right? Um, what do we need to know about the bathymetry? Where do we need to measure it? And <clears throat> in also trying to figure out where the uncertainty is in what we're doing. And we're also trying to take this IPA style prediction to other places around California. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Angelica, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about the resilient futures that we're doing in San Diego Bay. Angelica, are you there? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, so as you heard, I'm Angelica Rodriguez. I'm also a postdoc with the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation at Scripps. Um, I am the lead uh, Scientist working on the Resilient Future San Diego Bay project, which is a collaboration with San Diego Gas and Electric and the San Diego International Airport and the Port of San Diego. The goals of our project are really to generate data and model output so that we can better understand water level fluctuations, wave energy, and potential flood risk, both today and with uh, increasing sea level. Uh, this will help us um, inform effective decision-making for shoreline protection design, adaptation strategies, and flooding mitigation. And for me as a scientist, I'm particularly interested in getting a mechanistic understanding of um, the factors that go into driving these extreme water levels um, and the um, conditions that might be um, increasing in intensity in the future as the climate changes. So this is an aerial view of San Diego Bay, which houses 11,000 acres of marine habitat with the third largest eelgrass habitat area in California. And because of this diverse um, habitat, the San Diego Bay is home to a diverse population of uh, species that rear their young within the waters and also serve um, to use it as a breeding ground um, and migratory respite. Uh, additionally, as you can see, it's a highly urbanized water body with uh, several functions, which include military usage, recreation, um, international trade, and it's one of um, California's five major ports. So clearly it is a significant piece of shoreline to um, coastal communities and um, species within the coastal ecosystem. It's also slightly different than the open coast that Julia was um, describing in her work in Imperial Beach in that there are slightly different dynamics that we need to consider uh, for a semi-enclosed water body. And so Julia had this nice schematic of different uh, contributions to water level which were visualized on the open coast. And here, this is kind of looking at the same picture, but now with the data perspective. And so if you look on the y-axis, 
this is telling you the amount of energy and the x-axis is the frequency of that energy and this is how we partition uh, different processes and so the red is indicating these tidal peaks and somewhere um, at higher frequencies than the tides are um, infragravity waves and harbor stage and even higher frequency than that is uh, wind wave energy and so uh, this is data from a time series in San Diego Bay and so one of our first steps in this project was to look at the historical data to understand where the energy might be in the bay and what processes we really need to be thinking about. Um, we've also deployed several more sensors at various locations around the bay. This is a picture of one in the north end of the bay at the Nimitz Marine Facility, which is home to the Scripps vessels. Um, this particular pressure sensor sends its information real time to our servers at Scripps and we post it on our website. And so you can see the tidal fluctuations here and we also back out the um, wave heights from infragravity energy as well as the wind waves. So you can see that at times the purple line, which indicates the infragravity wave height is significantly higher um, than, than the significant wave height. And that uh, is proving to be an important uh, consideration. Um, we also want to understand how these signals propagate throughout the bay, and therefore we have distributed additional sensors. There's one currently at the Coast Guard station and another one farther south at the Chula Vista Bayfront, um, which is a major development area for the San Diego port. And uh, farthest south is um, our sensor that is in collaboration with the National Estuarine Research Reserve, um, where they also monitor water quality uh, variables as well. And so anecdotally, in this far south end, there is flooding on high tides, and this is an example of the nuisance flooding that we can expect to become more frequent uh, with rising sea levels. And so just to give you an overview of all the observations that we currently have in the bay, these are shown in green on this map and forthcoming observations include the Naval Amphibious Base, which will be a collaboration with the Navy, and uh, the Seaport Village Center, which is also another large development plan in along the bay shoreline. And so what I would like to emphasize is that all of these locations were determined with our partners and are co-located with critical infrastructure at, along the shoreline that we want to be able to plan for um, appropriately with the rising sea level. And so these observations are critical to informing our investigations of uh, numerical models. And I just want to show this screenshot from our website, which outlines the different uh, components to this project. And so historically, the uh, only wave modeling efforts have come from the Coastal Data Information Program, which you can see their um, forecast of waves for the entire Southern California coast shown here. And this is very valuable information. And it's what we use to um, sort of downscale these um, wave predictions or um, hindcasts. So in addition to the waves, which Julia pointed out as a critical component to the total water level prediction, uh, we are simulating the ocean currents as well because uh, we know that wave current interaction also tends to be an important um, modification to the wave field. So 
through downscaling our numerical models, we get to this finest resolution grid that accurately represents the bay, as shown in the red box there, and zoomed in onto the model domain. And so this model is essentially looking at the, the real ocean um, with realistic offshore oceanic conditions, atmospheric forcing, tides, and fine enough resolution to accurately represent the processes that we care about. So I'll just step back. So what we're seeing here is a simulation result. Uh, the upper left hand, here we go, you can see my mouse now. The panel in the upper left hand corner is showing the water level with the current vectors and the upper right hand corner is showing the wave height. And what you see here is for the most part, the waves are pretty uh, non-existent in San Diego Bay, except for specific time periods when the direction is such that the bay is no longer sheltered from that energy. And an interesting result that we have found is that these time periods within the winter often coincide with atmospheric river events. And so as evidence of that, we can look down here at a time series from the bay mouth here, the blue indicating um, the location of these time series. And we see that there are dips in the wave direction that indicate a more southerly swell. And these often are co coincident with um, high values of IVT. So IVT is the integrated vapor transport. It is the metric that atmospheric scientists use to uh, determine whether or not an atmospheric river um, is in the vicinity of your observations or model. And it's a function of both the wind speed and the specific humidity. So again, these are the time periods that we really care about when the North Bay sort of lights up green, indicating that the wave energy can make it into the bay. And this is just a composite image of what uh, an atmospheric river might look like. And as you can see, there is this um, long potential for fetch where uh, the wind can generate those more southerly waves. If we look um, as well at time series throughout the bay, we see that uh, the signal in the wave field is realized throughout the bay and attenuated as you go from the north to the south here, being lighter blue to darker blue. And there are coincident increases in um, the subtitle wave height shown by the red shading. And so if we know based on our current um, model simulations that this is something to be um, aware of in our extreme event scenarios, we want to represent this atmospheric phenomenon to the best of our abilities and um, make sure our ocean models are being driven appropriately. And so with this motivation, we've now established a new partnership with the Center for Western Weather Extremes, the CW3E, which is a different center at Scripps, and the California Nevada Climate Applications Program as well as continued work with San Diego Gas and Electric. And so with this continued effort, uh, we hope to be at the forefront of providing a state-of-the-art extreme uh, water level event uh, projection that can inform um, long-term planning. And we're also moving towards a um, short-term forecast system for the bay, uh, so that would be 
using uh, wave forecasts as well as atmospheric forecasts to then drive the ocean water level forecast. And we would continue to refine these models based on the data that we collect. So thank you for your time. And I think I'm the last speaker and we probably are taking questions at this point. Great, thank you, Angelica. Um, yes, you are right. We have a couple questions coming in. So folks, if you want to just continue submitting questions, we'll start going through these and then get to as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. So the first question, um, and any of you three can answer it. Um, are there any plans to evaluate or measure beach narrowings or coastal erosion from various events in the future? Um, I think I can probably take a stab at that one. We, we do have ongoing observations everywhere um, in Southern California where we do have, um, we drive our LIDAR truck and get observations of the beach and how the beach is changing. Um, and that's occurring on, um, we do jumbos, which is getting our offshore stuff on a quarterly basis. And then I believe the LIDAR is almost weekly at this point in some locations. So we do have observations of uh, beach narrowing and will have in the future. Yeah, I can Great, add. Thanks. So it sounds like, yeah, go ahead, Laura. Oh, I can just add. So we do have, yeah, mostly, as Julia mentioned, mostly in San Diego County um, is where um, Scripps is doing uh, beach observations, uh, although USGS and some other entities are, are monitoring beach width in um, other areas across California. Thank you. Um, next question is, are there any plans to integrate this modeling work into the adaptation planning for various communities? And I think that might have been specific to um, Angelica's presentation. You want to take a stab at it, Angelica? <laughs> um, I think you probably have a better handle on that than I do, but uh, I am participating in several meetings such as this and uh, additional um, meetings with the Climate Science Alliance and these types of organizations to get a better uh, relationship with these planners. Um, I think that it's important that they know about our work first and foremost so that we can um, open up that conversation, but it's certainly available to them if um, they want it. It's not, it's, it's open science. So um, yeah, they could contact me at any point. <laughs> yeah, I think for San Diego Bay, most of the observations and the work that Angelica has referenced is um, still pretty new. So a lot of the uh, we just got a lot number of those sensors in. We're still refining some of the information and the models. And then um, once uh, that's a little bit further down the road, it also can be used to start informing some of the adaptation strategies around San Diego Bay. Um, but that is the intention is to use the science um, to help look at specific areas, uh, not only in San Diego Bay, but similar that Julia showed in Imperial Beach, um, different streets may have different thresholds for flooding. So better understanding, um, you know, how uh, a near-term adaptation, adaptation strategy might just be to invest in uh, something like the flood forecasting system that Imperial Beach has, which allows a city to um, have like a three to five day window of alerts of flooding and prepare um, for that type of flooding better with their residents and with their um, lifeguard community. Um, and then the other component is when designing an adaptation strategy, whether it's elevating um, a road, whether it's uh, looking at adding more uh, uh, beach sand to protect something, whether it's looking at building a dune, the conditions uh, that we're pulling apart in terms of what the wave energy at one location 
uh, versus another location is uh, what that kind of exposure to these various different conditions that cause flooding um, is also the piece of information that is valuable for understanding what an effective adaptation strategy is going to be. So for instance, if an area floods, uh, more likely because of uh, wind waves and you know those are going to be more uh, more frequent in year round or as opposed to like a coastal storm which might be less frequent but more intense you know how would that factor into how you designed your adaptation strategy um, and so thinking about that long term what kind of um, strategies make sense to use um, in the short term as sort of um, buying time strategies and and things that might be in the long term um, those are those are ways in which we're trying to refine the models to help cities um, better understand what the timing of those strategies, what the duration of those strategies might be, and um, what the forcing is that they are uh, trying to address at individual sites and locations. Perfect. Thanks. That's a really detailed answer about how localized this research can be applied into local coastal communities. Um, we have, a, a re we're returning to the first question to reiterate a little bit more of what the asker is trying to get out. And the question is being rephrased as such. Can the wave run up be correlated to beach narrowing and or determine what magnitude events cause dune erosion? Uh, that okay, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, the for the modeling that I did, um, things like uh, the beach width and the beach narrowing or even beach nourishments were not included. Um, we specifically focused on eroded profiles only. And in future work, what we're going to try and do is um, take a look at that sort of thing. In terms of um, dune erosion itself, uh, right now the model that we use, the SWASH model, is not coupled to something like morphology. Um, I think some people, um, not at our institution, but elsewhere are working on making that coupling possible. And uh, hopefully in the fullness of time, we will be able to get that um, pinned down a little bit better. Does that answer the question? I would hope so. I think so. I think that was a great answer. Um, for now, we'll move on to another question. Um, have you had an opportunity to implement any mitigation or adaptation measures based on the data collected thus far? And if so, have you been able to collect data on the effectiveness of those measures implemented? such as sandbags preemptively placed on street ends. So that would probably relate to Imperial Beach. So uh, no, not currently. Um, I think most of what we found for Imperial Beach uh, was really looking at you know different areas along imperial beach and what happens to the beach during those events so better understanding um where some areas of that beach uh that were nourished or have a um less exposure to some of the wave direction and swell um were able to survive and protect uh the infrastructure behind it and other areas um the beach dropped like three feet within one um window of a of a storm so within a couple of hours and so that significantly impacts the flooding vulnerability of those locations and the ability of the waves to overtop in that location and cause flooding on the other side um so we had one, I think this last winter was the first uh, winter that we were able to do a little bit more drone footage um, and take a look at um, what was happening during the storm event. Um, but I think what you're getting at is, is the direction that the science is going and being able to throw in different variables and look at what happens during an extreme event. But so far, mostly, um, these events have not been monitored. Um, 
largely because it's tough to do technology and surveys during a storm and also get access to beaches that are um, completely eroded. Um, but the more that we can understand what goes on during this, these events, um, the better we can understand how effective those types of uh, strategies might work or not work. So if that makes sense, we can sort of try and still get the natural baseline of what happens during the event um, to know what, to be able to compare that with uh, whether or not a strategy works. Also mentioned that some of our team uh, not on the call are also involved in the monitoring of Cardiff Beach where the um, Cardiff dunes are in place. So that is part of the work that we are doing in terms of trying to evaluate um, adaptation strategies. Interesting. Thank you, Laura, for such a detailed response. Uh, the next question is about um, modeling um formats so many of us used cosmos to forecast future sea level rise and flooding events for san diego bay would this modeling system provide similar or better information what is the timeline in which this information would be available uh, so i'm sorry could you re rephrase the question or restate the question yeah, I'll reread it and see if I can synthesize it. Many of us used Cosmos to forecast future sea level rise and flooding events. For San Diego Bay, would this modeling system, I assume that means your modeling system, provide similar or better information as compared to Cosmos? And what's the timeline that your information could be available? Probably on more of a public, um, broader geographical area scale. So the the difference I see between the models that we're running and Cosmos is that we also have observations to ground tr truth what we're seeing in the simulations. And that's a m major benefit to what we're doing here. And in terms of looking, you know, more broadly across the coast, that is something that we're also trying to do in thinking about developing these forecasts we are not only thinking about san diego bay but trying to get um uh, support to think about other locations along the coastline primarily in southern california at this point but um yeah i think it right now uh cosmos is probably the best thing to use and Hopefully within the next year or so, we will have improvements on that in San Diego Bay specifically and can continue that effort uh, moving forward in other locations. I actually um, have a question, a follow up question for that, which is what is the what do you think the potential is for scaling up this methodology because it is so localized for um, communities and even street by street. Are you looking to replicate it in other study areas or scale it up into greater geographic regions at all in the future? So I can jump in there. So I think what we we're trying to kind of show with these two locations is the um, nuances of different types of beaches and different types of enclosed bay areas and how you uh, reduce the uncertainty in those kind of bigger cosmos models, how you can start to reduce uh, the uncertainty. Um, so when you do any kind of regional model, it doesn't have to be the USGS cosmos model, it can be the NOAA um, work as well. Um, it's done on a a broader scale. So when you bring it down to that street level um, and you really start to ask questions about, um, again, what causes flooding and how might that, uh, how might those variables increase uh, with climate change and sea level rise going forward, you, you need local observations to really validate what's happening in that, in your backyard, basically. And so, um, what we're trying to demonstrate here is uh, 
is a transferable model that's based on using different offshore uh, observations and um, or mostly nearshore. We have mostly we have a buoy network across California, the CDIP, that provides um, this really great backbone for wave information. But then, as Julia mentioned, is what ha what happens when that wave gets closer to shore? And that depends on the bathymetry, that depends on your shoreline and beach characteristics, um, that depends on the direction that the shoreline faces, um, and uh, exposure to things like king tides. And so uh, what we're trying to show is that there is a model, the model is basically putting out different observations for a year or two um, just to get a sense for what conditions and what extreme events in particular affect that area. And then using that um, type, the, using those observations to then refine these bigger scale models um, for a coastal community to be a little bit more sure about what's happening in their community and how to adapt to it going forward, um, both with forecasting and adaptation strategies. So the idea is that uh, you may not have to um, have all of those observations out uh, for a long period of time, um, but for a short period of time, if you're able to capture extreme events, it's those extreme events which are ultimately the factor that helps us um, refine the models. Um, as Julia was mentioning and showing, it was the star, it was that 2018 event that we were able to capture in Imperial Beach that really helps us uh, see what the sort of ex most extreme scenario could be in Imperial Beach in terms of eroded beach and um, combined wave and tide effects. Um, so the better we're able to capture things like El Nino seasons, um, atmospheric river events, um, these types of extreme events, the better able um, we are to provide communities with the tools to, re to uh, refine their forecasts and their predictions at that kind of local and site level. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So it takes a lot of on the ground observation as you were mentioning. Um, I think our last question is directed to Julia. What type of shoreline or backshore conditions is the IPA method most applicable for, such as sandy beach, revetted slopes, seawalls? Uh, that's a really good question. So right now, um, in terms of having the results, we've I've done the IPA at Imperial Beach and then also looked at it at Cardiff Beach. So at Imperial Beach, um, the bathymetry, it's all sandy, and then um, in an eroded prof profile, it comes and it hits a very steep um, beach face. At Cardiff, uh, the location that I'm looking at does have a reef um, on it. So the bathymetry is a little bit more stable seasonally, but there are a couple of changes, and we're trying to figure out what the effect that reef does have on um, making the wave run up bigger or smaller. And so in terms of applicability, I would say, honestly, at this point, I don't know <laughs> because I haven't tested other areas. So um, it would be cool to see how it works elsewhere. That's my answer for that. Okay, thank you, Julia. Uh, well, I think we're about running out of time. So thank you, Laura, Angelica, and Julia for all of your hard work and time sharing about this topic. And um, for those of you still here, slides and recordings will be available as soon as possible. Um, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Ella for any resources or additional questions. And I think with that, we're going to end for today. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you to our presenters. And everyone have a great day and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Ella. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care.